All right. Hi. I'm uh, Matt Hill, the curriculum designer here at MRU, and this is our last uh, day for the monetary policy um, unit plan. Now, this day is really designed for AP teachers or teachers that may be teaching, um, like have to teach um, the limited reserves model. You could probably get away with not, or actually, you definitely could get away with not teaching this day. Um, you know, if you're, if this is just like an on-level high school class and you don't have like the strict limited reserves or ample reserves that you have to, um, that you have to hit, um, you know, because of some guidelines or because your students are taking um, the AP test. All right. So let's go through it on this. Let's go through these days here. All right. So here we have the great financial crisis. Um, just sort of, I mean, your students are all probably way too young to remember, but hey, this was a big deal, this this great financial financial crisis. And we're going to ask the students as a bell ringer, do you think this financial crisis led banks holding more or less of their deposits in um, in reserves? Okay. And the correct answer is more as like, all right, you know, we're kind of unsure about what's happening in the world, so we better hold more money back. Um just in case something bad happens. Then we have a storyline activity, these sort of fun trend um, guessy game, guessing games that we do. And so it's going to look something like this, I would imagine, um, where you're going to see the reserves that banks are holding really shoot up post that financial crisis. Oh, look at that. Oh, well, started going down. All right, 92%. I'll take it. Okay, and here we can. Here's another just graph uh, showing that change. And so this is a this is a, actually a very very significant change that is going to turn out to really matter a lot for monetary policy. Now, like I said, if all you're teaching is sort of, you know, how monetary policy currently is done, what we've done up to this point will cover that. You know, the Fed changes their interest rate, and then that in turn affects all these other interest rates out in the economy all right but if you are still required to teach the limited reserves you're really going to need um this day that sort of connects the two worlds okay so why is the present different than the past well it's because of this because banks now hold so much cash in reserve and they did not do that prior to 2008 all right so we're summarizing this on this um uh on this slide and that is the difference you know in the parlance is limited reserves. So pre-2008, the banks had basically the bare minimum uh, that they, they would hold in reserve. And post-2008, the ample reserves that are holding um, a lot of money um, in reserves. Okay, now the target rate, the rate that the uh, Federal Reserve targets is the Fed funds rate. And this is a great example of economists being terrible and naming things uh, because the Fed does not control this rate even though it is called the federal funds rate, they don't control it. This is the rate that banks loan to one another, not the bank, not the rate that the Fed loans to banks. Um, this is the rate that banks loan to one another. So the Fed doesn't control it, but it, since it's sort of like the original interest rate, this is the basically what the banks charge other banks. Um, and so all the other interest rates are correlated with this rate um, in general. And so this is the one when the Fed is trying to raise rates, or lower rates, this is the rate that they target, but do not control um, directly. This is just a slide showing how that Fed funds rate, the blue line, is really related to these other rates that you might care about, the mortgage rate um, in red, and then a uh, the auto loan rate in purple. Okay. All right. So we're going to use our standard supply and demand um, uh, graph to understand how the Fed can influence this uh uh, the Fed funds rate. All right. So you can think of this is the market for reserves. So there's a market for, um, you know, bank reserves. Um, so there's a demand curve and there's a supply curve. Now, what is um, interesting about this mark, uh, this market or weird about this market is that in the short run, you know, that supply curve is perfectly inelastic. It's just straight up, um, uh, straight up there. All right. And so this is the market for reserves. And so where that supply of reserves crosses the demand for reserves, there that will be the interest rate that is paid. The price for using somebody's reserves um, will be the, the interest that I have to pay. Okay, now prior to 2008, what the Fed would do, we have this video kind of showing how the whole system worked prior to 
um, 2008. We have all the associated um, questions about what the Fed funds rate is. And here's sort of the punchline right here about how the Fed conducts monetary policy. Okay, if they have expansionary monetary policy, that's when they're trying to lower unemployment. They are going to buy securities, bonds from banks. This will increase the amount of cash that banks have on, on hand. So the Fed's going to go to the banks. Here's some money. Give me some securities in uh, uh, in return. So now, the, now these banks are more liquid. They have all this money that makes it easier to lend out. And therefore, the interest rate goes down. Okay. All right. And so just graphically, here's what's happening. When the Fed buys bonds or securities from banks, that moves the supply of reserves out, thereby lowering the policy rate, what's called the policy rate or the Fed funds rate. The policy rate is just um, AP will often use the policy rate um, and this more general term for the rate that, ben, uh, that banks loan to one another. All right. Now, if the Fed wants to raise um, the Fed funds rate, that would be contractuary, contractionary monetary policy. Um, essentially, they'd be trying to lower um, inflation here. So they're going to take money away from banks. The way they do that is they sell them something. Hey, here's this, here's this bond. Give me some money. This decreases the amount of cash that banks have, and that makes it harder to lend out reserves. And it, that, therefore, they will require more to lend those out. That will increase the rate they charge, the Fed funds rate. So here would be the graph. We're moving that supply of reserves back, and that raises the interest rate. All right, here's more video. And then here we have an interactive practice where students practice basically moving that supply curve and seeing how it affects the Fed funds rate. All right, and that's all, that's limited reserves. So that's prior to 2008, how, um, how the Federal Reserve was able to influence um, the Fed funds rate. Now, after 2008, things are different. The reason they're different is this graph right here. All of those excess reserves means the supply of reserves have shifted all the way to the right. That's the, our supply reserves now all the way um, over here. And so when it's all the way over there, like, you know, it, it's really hard to get back up on the downward sloping part of the demand curve. Basically, I'm on this flat part of the demand curve. And it's, I, it's really hard for me to move the interest rate. So when the Federal Reserve went to go raise rates, um, you know, after the great financial crisis, they realized, oh, our old tools are not really working because of these excess reserves. The banks are holding so much in excess. That supply curve has shifted so far to the right. So the Fed introduced um, some new tools or Fed had to use some new tools. So these are the main uh, administered rates that the Fed has. We've already talked about the IORB, the interest on reserve balance. That's the interest rate that the banks uh, sorry, that the Federal Reserve pays to banks. There's the discount rate. Now, if banks want to uh, um, borrow money from the Fed, um, this is the rate that the Fed will charge them. And then there's this overnight reverse repurchase rate, um, which is the interest rate. You think it's like an interest rate um, that is paid to um, like non-banks, like money market funds, these sorts of uh, financial institutions that basically... The, the financial institutions that don't get access to the IRB, they get access to this overnight reverse repurchase uh, rate. And uh, again, it's I think as I am saying these words, it's becoming clear how terrible uh, economists are and naming things. Um, but that's just uh, the hand we've been dealt. Now, this overnight reverse repurchase rate, don't worry about it. Um, uh, it's uh, not required on um, the AP. It is important in real life. So this is just a bit tangent. You don't need to talk about this to your students. This is just for your own interest. It is important in real life because the Fed funds rate basically is in between the IORB and the overnight reverse repurchase rate. Basically, the IORB is a leaky floor for the Fed funds rate. And so the real floor is the overnight reverse repurchase rate. So the, the actual, when you actually look at the data, the Fed funds rate is in between these two. Okay. But that's not, uh, you don't need to worry about that. Um, that's more, I don't know, college level or, uh, you know, above, or if you work at the Fed or something. <laughs> um, now, the rate we're going to focus on is the IORB. That's the one we focused on um, uh, previously. That basically puts a price floor on the Fed uh, funds rate. Now, I said in the real world, it's a leaky floor, but don't worry about that. Don't need to confuse your students with this. Okay, so... The IORB is the interest rate 
that um, uh, that the Fed pays to banks. All right, now this is a price floor. The Fed funds rate, basically what I'm going to get from other banks, the interest I'm going to get from other banks, it can't be below this rate because I can always just go get this rate from the Fed. So this is a price floor for the Fed funds rate because look, if I'm if, if I'm putting my reserves in another bank and they're trying to offer me less than the IORB, I'm like, why would I take that from you? I'm, I'll just go to the Fed and um, and I'll get the IORB. So now, like I said, in the real world, not everyone, not everyone who's looking uh, to park their reserve somewhere is a bank and has access to the IORB, which is why it's a leaky floor. Um, uh, and the overnight reverse repurchase rate is at the actual floor. But that's, again, we don't need to worry about that for um, your students. You can just say, look, the IORB is the floor. It's what the Fed's paying. And so basically nobody's going to take uh, nobody's going to take less than that because they can go to the Fed and get the IORB. So this is a price floor. And since that supply curve is pushed all the way out there to the right, our Fed funds rate is actually going to be basically what the IORB is since it's, that's where the supply curve hits the demand curve. All right. Now, we have this flat part at the top of the demand curve now. That's the discount rate. This is the price ceiling um, for the um, uh, uh, the Fed funds rate. Um, basically, if I, if I need to borrow money, I can always go to the Fed. If I'm a bank and I need to borrow money, I can always go to the Fed and they will charge me the discount rate. So this is the most I would pay because I can always, if I need to borrow money, that's always there from the Fed. Now in practice, it doesn't really matter much for um, our graph, but you know, just to be complete, we should put the discount rate on there because this is the graph that the college board likes students to draw for the ample reserve model. Okay, so the Fed funds rate turns out to be right at where the IORB is. As I mentioned, the Fed funds rate is sometimes called the policy rate. All right, so if I want to raise that Fed fund rates, now everything is super easy. With ample reserves, I just, like we already covered, I just raise the IORB and voila, the Fed fund rates uh, moves up. Now, in practice, when the when the Federal Reserve moves the IORB up, they move all their other rates up too. So this, that's why the discount rate is going up here too. If I want to lower the Fed funds rate, I just lower the IORB and monetary policy made easy now these days in the Apple Reserve environment. Again, the Fed just changes their IORB, the Fed funds rate changes, then all the other interest rates change. Easy peasy. All right. Here are some practice questions for your students, just to make sure they understand it. Okay. And finally, as an exit ticket, um, which method of implementing monetary policy do you think the Fed prefers and why? There's not really a right or wrong answer. I will, well, there is, I guess, a right answer because the Fed has said they prefer the Apple <laughs> Preserves model, uh, but I wouldn't grade this too, too harshly. Uh, so the Fed has basically said we prefer the Apple Reserves model. We want to stay in the Apple Reserves model. So actually, one of the things they might do is make sure this supply curve is staying all the way on the flat part. So they may still do some open market operations, um, buying bonds from banks to make sure the supply reserve stays over here on the flat part, and then they can just move the Fed funds rate by moving the IORB. All right, that's our last day. Like I said, a bit of a technical day, but hopefully we mixed up some fun stuff with the storyline. We got that interactive practice. Um, we got some cool graphs, so hopefully making it a little less painless for those of you that have to teach the limited reserves model or for those of you that are AP teachers. God bless you. Um, all right. I will. Uh, that's it. That's it for the monetary policy. Is it, see, isn't monetary policy fun, easy? Uh, well, I don't know, but easy, but easy, but you know, it should be uh, mostly harmless, mostly painless learning about uh, monetary policy from us at MRU. You can get the monetary policy unit plan here or click for the next video.